In the summer of 1692, two young girls living in a cottage on the outskirts of colonial America, at the very edge of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, began exhibiting very strange behavior. They would convulse, they would scream, they would laugh hysterically, and other times they would lay perfectly still, staring at nothing. The head of their household was an influential minister in the town, and when prayer and medicinal remedies did nothing to calm the girls, he knew only one thing could be afoot. The devil. Anyone with any background knowledge in the Salem Witch Trial or anyone who's read The Crucible knows the basic setup. In Salem, in 1692, two girls living in the minister Samuel Paris's house fell ill, convulsing, having fits, and acting strange and hysterical. After medicinal treatments and prayer did nothing to help the girls, it was feared that the devil had entered Salem. But I want to take a step back and find out how we got to this place. What was happening in 1692 Massachusetts Colony to lead to the mass hysteria that would end in over 160 people accused of witchcraft, 19 people executed, one tortured to death, and at least five people dying in prison. First, let me thank my partner on today's video, Upside. Upside is an app that helps you earn cash back on your daily purchases from the gas pump to the grocery store. And with inflation continuing to rise, a penny saved truly is a penny earned. And you can earn cash back with every purchase thanks to Upside. Thankfully, gas prices have started to fall, but when they were at their peak, and even now, Upside has been a lifesaver. It's super easy to use. You just open the app on your phone and it shows you nearby offers. And then you click on the offer that you want to claim and it will give you easy instructions to get your cash back, usually by checking in when you get there or uploading a copy of your receipt. You then earn your cash back and can cash it out whenever you want via PayPal, e-gift card, or your bank account. I love using Upside at the gas pump and I'll be using my cash back dollars that I'm earning to buy my niece and nephew some pretty incredible Christmas gifts. Gotta upkeep that cool aunt vibe, you know what I mean? Compared to credit card rewards and loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. To get started, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play. Use my promo code Leja and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Thanks, Upside. Salem is located 16 miles north of Boston, and in 1692, it was divided between Salem Town and Salem Village. Salem Town was a larger commercial port area with more money and influence. Salem Village was located to the west and was agriculturally based and less influential. Salem Village was a more traditional farming community that was very insular, focused on the community and on traditional Puritan values. And in 1692, there was a lot of change and uncertainty, especially in the Massachusetts colony. It was still an English colony. William and Mary were ruling England at this point, but there was a revocation of the Massachusetts Bay Charter in 1684, which left the Massachusetts Bay Colony in legal limbo until a new charter was issued in 1692. And of course, even though it was issued in 1692, things needed to travel across the ocean, so it took a long time for them to even know what their new charter said and what laws actually governed the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Additionally, at this point, Salem was on really the frontier of colonial America, meaning they had very recent history of very violent and bloody clashes with indigenous people whose land that they were slowly encroaching upon. With this recent violent history and a small insular community living on the edge of an extremely dark, forested abyss filled with what they saw as terrifying groups of people that could come out of the shadows and murder them at any moment, we're dealing with very uncertain and hysterical times in history here. On top of that, the people living in Salem Village at the time were dedicated to extreme puritanical values, which include a constant fear of the devil using any opportunity to enter their society and wreak havoc. Additionally, Puritanism viewed the soul as feminine, which to them meant weak and vulnerable. And putting the soul then in a feminine body meant that it was twice as vulnerable to corruption by the devil. It was in this atmosphere that two young girls, Abigail Williams and Betty Paris, began experiencing convulsions, hysteria, and other inexplicable behaviors that led the Reverend Paris and soon all of Salem to believe that the devil had entered their community. Once the community had become convinced that witchcraft was afoot, it was only a short matter of time before Abigail Williams and Betty Paris began naming names, the first of which was Tituba, an enslaved woman under Reverend Paris. 
We don't have a ton of information on Tichuba because she was an enslaved person, so there were very few formal records on her. Most accounts say she comes from somewhere in the Caribbean, probably Barbados, because Reverend Paris had land in Barbados, though some say that she was indigenous to America. Of the three people who were originally accused of witchcraft, Tichuba was the only one to survive. She was accused of fortune-telling and potentially putting an egg white in a glass of water a practice deemed by Puritans to be demonic. She would confess to engaging in witchcraft, and this would spark the beginning of the trials. She also implicated two others, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, as her accomplices. Now let me just take a moment to pause and consider the roles that gender and race played in the Salem witch trials. Of course, with Tituba, we've got both gender and race at play because Tituba was an enslaved woman who wasn't white. She was expected to live up to the severe expectations that were put on women to be submissive and pious, and Tituba, like all women in Salem, was feared for her potential danger to submit to the devil because of her weak soul and weak feminine body. But she was doubly feared because of her proclivity as an enslaved woman to be a sinner and a witch. Race aside, the vast majority of those accused in the Salem witch trials were women. Many of the women who would go on to be executed for their alleged witchy activity would be women who did not fit within the strict confines of what was expected of a woman in Puritan America. Some of them had amassed wealth or land that was outside the norm. Some of them were widowed, therefore were not beholden to a man to use that wealth. Some of them, on the other hand, were incredibly poor, living on the margins, potentially dealing with mental health issues, certainly dealing with a lifetime of trauma, trying to get by, but seen very much as an outsider within the insular Salem community. And of course, it wasn't just men doing the accusing either. Women were accusing women left and right. A nice little reminder of how the patriarchy tends to be self-reinforcing. The two women that Tituba implicated are good examples of this. Sarah Good, also known as Goody Good, who, not to brag, I played in my high school's rendition of The Crucible. No big deal. She came from a wealthy background, but was left in poverty due to some litigation surrounding her father's estate, and because she assumed the debt of her first husband, who had died. She was an outsider who moved into Salem society later, and she took a second husband and had two children, but they struggled with poverty. Her second husband, William Good, worked as a laborer for people around Salem Village, but the family was homeless, renting rooms in others' homes, and they had a bad reputation, in part because sometimes Sarah Good wasn't always in a very good mood. You know what they say about women who are in a bad mood? It's not allowed. You gotta smile. Even Sarah's six-year-old daughter Dorcas, unfortunate name, was pressured into testifying against her. However, Dorcas was later accused herself of witchcraft and then imprisoned for more than seven months as a six-year-old. Sarah never confessed and was sentenced to hang. She was pregnant while she was in prison, and so she was pardoned until she gave birth. That child ended up dying in prison with her because many of these Salem prisoners were held in a dungeon prison down in Boston, where the conditions were frigid, uncomfortable, and not hospitable to life. After Sarah Good gave birth, her execution was scheduled, and she was officially executed on July 19th, 1692. She maintained her innocence until the end. Sarah Osborne is another stark example of what happens when you were a woman with any sort of power or who did not fit into the confines of Salem society. Sarah was a widow. When she died, her husband had given her his land until their sons came of age. However, after the death of her first husband, Sarah hired an indentured man to help around the property, and they eventually fell in love and got married. So Sarah got money and land from her first husband and then married an indentured servant below her and was able to hold on to that estate from her first husband for herself and her new husband. So there's a rejection of the traditional patterns of land tenure and inheritance that landed Sarah Osborne in a position outside of traditional Salem societal values. Sarah Osborne never confessed to being a witch. She did attempt to defend herself by saying that the devil had taken her form without her consent or participation. A number of men in Salem accused her of afflicting the young girls, but she never confessed, and she also never accused anyone else, which seems to be pretty Pretty rare. Sarah Osborne eventually died in prison before being tried. So these women are examples of how gender played out in the trials of the Salem witches in 1692, but who were the triers? 
Who were the people who were enforcing these laws against these mostly women? Well, funny you should ask, they were all men, of course. First, we have John Hawthorne. Born into a well-established Salem family in 1641, he became a local magistrate and was chosen by the governor to be a judge in the Salem witch trials, during which Hawthorne really took on the role of prosecutor rather than impartial judge, which led him to intensive questioning that always began with the presumption of guilt rather than innocence. He altered the tradition of previous witch trials by encouraging those under examination not only to confess to being witches, but also to name others who might also be witches, which accelerated the number of accusations and the hysteria. He was later a prominent target of criticism by his own great-grandson, Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Scarlet Letter, ever heard of it? Next, we have Samuel Sewall. He was born in England in 1652, but moved to America at the age of nine, got a couple degrees from Harvard, married into a wealthy family, and became a prominent member of the merchant class. He was selected by the governor to sit as a judge for the witch trials, which he did, but then years later, Sewall would issue a public confession showing his own remorse and taking the blame and shame for his part in condemning innocent people during the Salem witch trials, and he was the only judge to do so. And then finally, we have Lieutenant Governor William Stoughton, who was appointed Chief Justice of the court for the Salem Witch Trials in 1692. He ruled over the trials, determined to eradicate all witches from Massachusetts Bay Colony. He was heavily influenced by his conservative religious convictions. And after the court dissolved, Stoughton continued to enjoy political success and power, and never apologized for his role in the trials. In addition to these judges in the court, there are a couple of other key figures that I would be remiss not to mention and that is, of course, Cotton Mather and Increase Mather, two of the strangest names in recorded history. Increase Mather was the dad of the two. He was born in 1639. He was an influential Boston minister, and he had the ear of many of the judges and other people in power at this time because he was the president of Harvard College, and he was a confidant of Governor William Phipps. He has, however, been credited with having brought at least a modicum of moderation throughout the Salem witch trials, and he helped bring an end to them with the circulation of a publication called Cases of Conscience in October of 1692. Though many historians have criticized him for his hesitancy to take a firm stand against the trials earlier in the summer of 1692. And then we have his son, Cotton Mather, who is truly one of the most infamous figures in the history of Puritan New England. He was also a prominent Bostonian minister and author. He was born in 1663, and he was a stalwart believer in the direct influence of the devil upon the physical world through the spiritual realm. He was regularly consulted by the judges during the witch trials, and he was friends with all of the major authorities involved. So his opinions and beliefs heavily swayed the direction of the trials and of the executions. He was then appointed as the first historian of the trials after they took place. His book was commissioned and called The wonders of the invisible world, which served to justify the trials. And he was kind of hated for this book until the day he died on February 13th, 1728. So we have very powerful and influential men in this tiny insular community holding a series of trials against over 160 accused, mostly women, using a variety of legal methods, some of which were outdated and others of which were completely illegal. So the law in the Massachusetts Bay Colony came directly from England, the colonizer, obviously, but had been changed in the years since the colony had taken shape. Their laws were based on the Witchcraft Act of 1604, which is an English law making witchcraft a felony. A minor offense under that law would get you a year in prison, and if accused and found guilty a second time, the sentence was death. In 1641, the General Court, which was the legislative body of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, drafted what was called the Body of Liberties, a collection of civil and criminal laws and rights, and most of these were later included in the colony's first compilation of statutes. The Body of Liberties originally had 12 capital offenses, including witchcraft. The law on witchcraft was short and cited biblical authority. It said, if any man or woman be a witch, that is, hath or consulteth with a familiar spirit, they shall be put to death. 
citing Exodus and a number of other biblical passages. And while witchcraft was outlawed, and in some cases a capital offense, the reality was that few people were actually executed for witchcraft before the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. Juries were often reluctant to convict, or the accused were given sentences for lighter offenses. In the English tradition, the rules of evidence were vague, but legal experts insisted that there needed to be clear and convincing proof of the crime. The best proof being confession and testimony of at least two trustworthy people that the accused had acted with magical powers driven by the devil. Even confessions on their own were considered doubtful without support from any other evidence. And in England, spectral evidence was not acceptable as evidence. Spectral evidence is testimony in which a victim says that they experienced an attack by a witch in their spirit form, invisible to anyone else. In England, that evidence didn't fly. However, like we said, Salem was in this weird limbo space because the Massachusetts Bay Charter had been suspended and the new government and the new laws were not firmly in place. This lack of clarity, plus the growing hysteria over the afflictions, led to the admission of spectral and other unreliable evidence. The court in the Salem Witch Trials was called the Court of Oyer and Terminer to be heard and determined. And they had a set process for dealing with the accused. First, the accused was brought in for investigation. This investigation included a physical examination for the devil's mark. The devil's mark was any sort of skin lesion or flap or mole, anything that looked slightly unusual on the body. It was believed that the devil would confirm his pact with a witch by giving her or him a mark of identification. Historians believe that these marks often might have just been extra nipples. <laughs> it was believed that witches had familiars in the form of animals that would suckle at the witch's teat. It was also thought that these devil's marks were cold and couldn't feel anything because they were created by the devil. So they would perform a test by pricking the devil's mark to see if there was any pain. The accused would also be brought into the presence of their accusers for them to demonstrate the effect of the accused specters upon them. There would also be testimony as to spectral evidence. There are different categories of spectral evidence. You've got testimony from observers about the odd behaviors and symptoms exhibited by the afflicted. You got in-court demonstrations, such as if the accused did something, the afflicted would then experience pain or something. For example, when Martha Corey was on the stand, there was a direct account that said, it was observed several times that if goodwife Corey did but bite under her lip in time of examination, the persons afflicted were bitten on their arms and wrists and produced the marks before the magistrates, ministers, and other and then there was also testimony by victims about experiences of spectral occurrences outside of the court. Visions that they had experienced and things that were said or done to them. Other forms of evidence included trials by test, such as recitation of the Lord's Prayer to see whether the accused could say the Our Father without any sort of mistake. Which of course everyone in the colony would have had the Our Father memorized by heart at this point, but when you've been accused of being a witch and your life is literally on the line, making a mistake while talking in court in front of a panel of judges is pretty understandable. Another trial by test was called the laying of hands, where the accused would lay their hands on the accuser. And if the accuser's affliction suddenly stopped, then the thinking was that the spell had been returned into the witch's body, which of course is pretty obviously highly suspect. And Cotton Mather himself was not in favor of the laying of hands because he believed that that in itself would be working with the devil and conducting witchcraft. Of all these methods, spectral evidence was one of the most decisive factors in the witchcraft cases. Every condemned witch was accused of at least one incident of spectral activity besides the examination itself. The judges would try to empirically test this spectral evidence by, for example, matching sets of teeth to bite marks on arms and comparing wounds on the accused to places where their specters had supposedly been hit. And they would observe the girls themselves during examinations. Again, if the accused witch bit her lip, the girls would scream out. If the accused would pinch her fingers together, the girls would claim that they had been pinched. To the judges during the Salem witch trials, this in itself was proof of the spectral evidence veracity. During the course of the Salem Witch Trials, there was a denial of basic rights and legal protections of the accused. Hearsay was allowed in court, hearsay being a rule that prevents the use at trial of statements made outside of court, which today plays a critical role in ensuring the reliability of evidence. 
But back in the 1600s, though there was the idea of hearsay, it was not fully developed or followed until around the 1700s. Additionally, the accused were not given their own legal counsel. There were no defense lawyers present or allowed at these proceedings. The accused were also not allowed to cross-examine the witnesses against them. Things that are very basic rights, which are given to the accused today. It was through these methods that the court of Oyer and Terminer held Salem witch trials throughout the summer and fall of 1692, resulting in the execution of 19 people and the death of five people in prison while awaiting their final sentencing. It also resulted in the death by torture of one person, Giles Corey. He pled not guilty to accusations of witchcraft, but refused to submit himself to a trial because he was certain that his guilt was already determined because in every previous trial where the accused had pled not guilty, not a single person was cleared. Because he stood mute and refused to proceed with the trial, he was pressed to death by slowly being covered by heavy stones until he died, with his famous last words being, more weight. In the entire history of the United States, Giles Corey is the only person to have ever been pressed to death by court order. In fact, at that point in 1692, pressing was illegal in Massachusetts. No law permitted pressing as a court-ordered punishment. And it even went against the Puritan provisions of the Body of Liberties because it was considered barbarous punishment. You'll recall that at this point, Massachusetts Bay Colony was in legal limbo. And in December of 1692, the Court of Oyer and Terminer was dissolved. And a new court, the Superior Court, was placed as the highest Massachusetts court. That court heard the remaining cases of those waiting to stand trial in January of 1693. That court, now with the laws solidly in place, did not allow for the use of spectral evidence. All of those cases tried by this new court resulted in either an acquittal or a pardon, which is an indication of the importance of the use of spectral evidence to create hysteria and lead to convictions in the court of Oyer and Terminer during the Salem Witch Trials. In the aftermath, some of the defendants went on to file defamation lawsuits, though only four of 15 such cases were successful. By May of 1693, Governor Phipps had pardoned and released all of those remaining in prison on witchcraft charges. In the ensuing years after the hysteria was over, Massachusetts recognized the witch trials for what they were and began a centuries-long process of atoning for their actions. In 1697, Samuel Seawall expressed his guilt. In 1702, the General Court of Massachusetts declared the trials unlawful, and the colony passed a bill overturning the witchcraft convictions in 1711, mentioning 22 individuals specifically. And multiple centuries later, in 1957, a resolution in Massachusetts Massachusetts exonerated additional victims and formally apologized for the events of 1692. However, the last of the accused to be exonerated was a woman named Elizabeth Johnson, and she was exonerated this past summer. 2022. She was accused, convicted, and implicated others, and she was sentenced to death. However, she was one of the few who were pardoned before their execution by Governor Phipps in 1693. Her name had been omitted in the initial exoneration efforts. But then, an eighth grade teacher named Carrie Lapierre came across Johnson's story and involved her students in the effort to get her exonerated by the Massachusetts state government, an effort which took three years to achieve. And in 2022, this past summer, Massachusetts specifically specifically added Johnson's name to the existing 1957 exoneration resolution. Thank you once again to my partner on today's video, Upside. Reminder to download the free Upside app and use my code Leja to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Thanks, Upside. If you enjoyed this and want to support my work bringing you videos like this, please consider becoming a member of this channel or joining me over on Patreon, where we have a lively Discord chat, Leja's book club, behind the scenes stuff, and so much more. Thank you especially to newest Patreon supporters, Helen Hunt on Wheels, Travis Willett, Nathan, and Tay. And as always, thank you to my royal patrons, Old Man Pence, Fork McSpoon, Ellen L, Daniel Taylor, and Lita M. Thomas. And a very special thank you to my multi-platinum patrons, Brett Piontek and Cyrus Solka. Your generosity is greatly appreciated, and it makes this channel what it is. So thank you so much. If you liked this video, you might like this special spooky season playlist I've made of all of my past spooky season videos. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.